Thank you all. Um, I always like to say that when a neurologist is in a, a, around a bunch of vascular specialists, it's usually a bad prognostic feature. So um, I hope that uh, it's not the case that anyone's having a stroke and that that's why I'm here. But um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, ischemic stroke. And um, I thought I had 15 minutes, but it looks like I have 13. So we'll take this quickly. Let's see if I can get to advance. There we go. So, um, you know, unlike many organs, you know, there's no troponin of the brain, there's no creatinine in the brain, there's no EKG that we can quickly use to assess for brain ischemia. So diagnosing acute ischemic stroke is a, um, a challenge. It's a purely a clinical diagnosis, and then we have it either supported or refuted by data. So in our stroke center, in a typical day, we have about five to ten stroke evaluations that come in, and if you take the number six, um, turns out that in a population of patients being evaluated for stroke, one out of six times will get the diagnosis wrong and think the patient's not having a stroke, and one out of six times will get the diagnosis wrong thinking the patient is having a stroke when they're not. So the frequency of misdiagnosis is quite high in stroke. I'd like to think we're a little bit better than that, but uh, that's what uh, the data says. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, mimics are common. For one thing, uh, old deficits, if a person's had a previous stroke and something goes wrong, their blood pressure drops, they have a metabolic deterioration, they have sepsis, all those things make the stroke seem like it's coming back. Um, a patient who has an unwitnessed seizure and is simply found down will often have a so-called TODS paralysis or weakness and focal deficits from the seizure, so that can look like a stroke. And then there are some things that we see in patients who have relatively fewer vascular risks, migraines, vertigo, intoxication. These things can present just like stroke as well. So what are the, the things that make you think that you are dealing with a stroke, the markers that it is actually a stroke? And really, I always like to say the most important biomarker for acute stroke is uh, elevation of blood pressure. If a patient does not have a blood pressure elevation, you have to really think, are, are we dealing with an acute stroke? That can happen. It can happen in a case where a person is very infected and has a poor intervascular volume. It can happen in a case with a patient with severe cardiomyopathy. But in your run-of-the-mill cases, it should be very rare that the patient doesn't elevate their blood pressure with stroke. And then the other thing that you should always look for in a patient with stroke is some decrease in mental status. The, the patient doesn't have to be attended. They don't have to be unresponsive. But a fully alert, awake patient with a facial droop almost certainly has a Bell's palsy. So if you don't see some decrease in alertness, you should be thinking it's probably not a stroke. So markers that the symptoms are not a stroke, that you're probably dealing with a mimic, would be that we really don't see patients becoming excessively emotional or agitated with strokes. That's fairly uncommon. Uh, pain, especially pain at onset, should, should, should make you think you're dealing with something else. Rarely dissections can do that, but for the most part, strokes are not painful. When we talk about a stroke, we're talking about deficits. So a deficit of sensation means numbness, or as I tell patients, a Novocaine-like sensation. If instead you're getting a positive phenomenon, a tingling kind of feeling, that's usually not a stroke. And then the amount of time it takes for a stroke to develop is, you know, ischemia has to set in, the ischemia has to affect the tissue, the tissue has to stop working, and then that, that takes many minutes. And really we think of a stroke taking, takes about 10 minutes to begin to present symptoms. So something that's fleeting, such as less than five minutes, is rarely a stroke. Pallor, incontinence, chest pain, shortness of breath, these features uh, should make you be thinking of other diagnoses. And then finally, I'd just say isolated slurred speech. If there's no facial droop, if there's no weakness, if there's no ataxia, nothing else to go along with it, slurred speech in and of itself is usually not a stroke. So thinking less about what's not a stroke and what some pitfalls are, things that can, can easily slip up and think that uh, you're not dealing with a stroke, is that a patient who has improvement, that's probably the most common thing, is that the patient wasn't doing well, but they're improved. Unless they're really 100% resolved and back to baseline, that's not a TIA. That's still a stroke. So that should be treated as such. And the other thing is that patients can have ticks and fleas. They can have a intoxication and have a stroke. They can have anxiety and have a stroke. And, and that can make it difficult to, to sort out what's what. Um, and then, like I said, old symptoms often present, but uh, old and new can occur together. So once we think we're dealing with a stroke, once we're, we think we're dealing with ischemia, we start to get some data. And the first data we almost always get is a CAT scan. So the 
the important thing to realize is CAT scan is obviously not there to establish the diagnosis. It's there to rule out intracerebral hemorrhage. So intracerebral hemorrhage can present similar to ischemic stroke, and because of that, we need the CT to, to make sure that's not the case. There are some clues you can get from a CT. Sometimes you do see early hypodensity. Sometimes you see blurring of the cortical junction. Sometimes you see a vessel that becomes dense because it has clot in it. So all those things may be there, but really that's not the purpose of the CT. MRI would be great, even in institutions that are set up for acute stroke. Getting a patient to MRI, getting the MRI done, getting them back takes about 45 minutes to an hour. So no matter how sophisticated we are, that's, that's too long. And so we don't use an MRI to diagnose acute stroke. Um, there's some vessel imaging, and now we are doing some of this acutely, and it can be done with MRA, CT angio, which is the modality of choice in the ER, Dopplers, and then, of course, angiogram. All of those things have good negative predictive values. So if you have a patient who has one of those modalities done that comes back normal, you can be pretty confident you're dealing with a normal. But if they come back with an artifact from moving during their MRI or a poor injection with CTA or the Doppler has a lot of calcification, you want to be thinking about doing either a second non-invasive test or an angiogram. Especially in the posterior circulation, that's an area where we've seen a high incidence of false negatives. So I just want to pull up a couple examples of CTs. I know that uh, you all may not uh, look at a lot of CTs, but I just want to show this as an example of a patient we saw this, this week who had uh, kind of atypical stroke symptoms on the um, orthopedic service. He was complaining of uh, some neck pain when he walked, but he said, that's exactly what my stroke felt like before. And so I thought that this was going to be one of those exacerbation cases. And uh, the CT comes back, and this is read as negative by your radiologist. So you really want to kind of clue your radiologist into what they're looking at and what you're worried about, because this is not by any means a negative uh, CT. There's, qu there's quite a bit of um, hypodensity on the CT, so you're dealing with a lot of chronic cerebral vascular disease. When there's a lot of hypodensity on a CT, you're never going to see an acute stroke. So it's there. turned out we did an MRI, and sure enough, there was an acute stroke hiding in that hypodensity. This is another patient where the clinical information is very important and why you want to be communicating with your radiologist and not just showing them a, a patient without any clinical information. This is a patient in a CCU who had an acute ischemic stroke, and on the uh, panel that's on the left-hand side, you can see that right parietal hypodensity. But if you didn't inform your radiologist that this patient had a platelet count in the teens, they may not go looking for subtle bleeds. And sure enough, in that left parietal region, I wish I could show you the pointer. Sure yeah, the, the left parietal region has a little hyperdensity that's a subtle subarachnoid hemorrhage. So that back and forth communication with the radiologist is critical. So some other diagnostic pearls about stroke workups. Really, echocardiogram is not that uh, necessary for a patient with a normal EKG. Um, we do look for monitoring of patients with, for atrial fibrillation. Of course, it's paroxysmal. The natural history is that it becomes more frequent with time. So the more you look, the more you find AFib. Uh, as stroke neurologists, we're getting more and more enthusiastic about doing long-term monitoring, 30 days, three years, depending on how um, enthusiastic you are. Uh, PFO testing, PFO testing is something that uh, applies to many patients with cryptogenic stroke in which you don't know what's going on. Uh, I rarely do these in inpatient workups anymore. I do like to do the full workup before diagnosing a patient with cryptogenic and then letting them become a little bit stronger and more alert to do those Valsalva uh, as an outpatient. And then, of course, soft neurological signs are relevant, especially in chronic ischemia. Those of you who are going to be looking at carotid disease, patients with high-grade carotid stenosis, these soft neurological symptoms are important to me. The patient's mood, memory, dizziness, excessive fatigue, that, that can be relevant. So acute management. Acute management has always, uh, up until this year, been about TPA. And that means call the stroke team. And so if you don't, if your institution is, uh, doesn't have a stroke team, find out what the equivalent is. But what you can do is get a stat CT and a blood glucose. Um, let us know what concomitant drugs the patient's on, especially anticoagulants, and then establish a last known well. It's not that important to me when the patient was noticed to have a deficit. It's really important to me when they were last known to be at their neurological baseline. That's when the clock starts ticking for TPA. We now use a four-and-a-half-hour window for TPA, and many patients who are not candidates for TPA are eligible for that new treatment, which is endovascular clot retrieval. In fact, endovascular clot retrieval may be a valuable option up to 12 hours or beyond. 
So uh, secondary medical management, this is the things that you already know about atherosclerosis for heart disease, peripheral arterial disease, but there's, there's some points to make about um, stroke. First of all, no organ suffers more from hypertension in the brain. If you look at the effect of hypertension, there's more ischemia in the brain than any other organ. So you really do need to target 120 over 80 for these patients. I recommend adding therapy when the patient isn't uh, at therapy, at their therapeutic target. Um, these are the drugs that we like. Of course, they're the same ones you all like. Um, and then it, to just give it some information to your patient, if you're, ex if you're explaining why you're giving them all these antihypertensives, going from blood pressure in the 160s to control blood pressure reduces their relative risk of stroke by half. No other therapy we have is that powerful. And again, if they do their part, if you do your part with good medical management, their annual risk of recurrent stroke goes from 8 to 20% to 2 to 3%. That's a pretty profound shift. Statins, we're very enthusiastic about statins. We always push statins on our patients. The Sparkle and Jupiter trials are why. They show 20 and 48% relative risk reductions in stroke. It's not about the numbers. It's about the risk. If we use a Torvastatin or Resuvastatin high dose, this is a common thing you'll hear from patients about muscle aches. So if they're getting muscle aches, the first question is, it, is it interfering with your life? If it's not interfering with your life or your activities, that's the price you pay for stroke prevention. If it is interfering with your life, then I, re I reduce the frequency of the dose, not the intensity of the dose. So every other day dosing, sometimes even weekly dosing. Antiplatelet therapy, a lot of talk and a lot of concern about antiplatelets, but it's relatively less important for what we do. Um, I'll be brief and say aspirin has some uh, important benefits for that it's predictable, that it wears off quickly. Clopidogrel is uh, also important. It's good for patients who have GI upset, somewhat less predictable metabolism and takes a longer time to wear off. If patients can't tolerate those, we have silastazole, an old drug that does benefit stroke prevention. Other drugs such as uh, Agronox and the newer antiplatelets are not that uh, frequently used. Uh, dual therapy is something that we get asked a lot about. For the brain, dual therapy is only beneficial in, in the first few weeks, maybe the few, a few months. Beyond that, it's not that helpful. Uh, for other organs, the heart, uh, peripheral arterials, it may be beneficial. Anticoagulation, of course, is indicated for atrial fibrillation, possibly beneficial in low EF, indicated in arterial hypercoagulable conditions and cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, and similar efficacy in dissections. Choice of anticoagulant, uh, for non-valvular AFib, we're trending towards the novel drugs, uh, simply because there's a class effect of decreased intracranial hemorrhage. For neurologists, that's very important. For non-AFib, we balance many factors, including the patient's concerns, um, but morphine and, and anoxaparin remain our first lines. Just a quick advertisement for those of you who are doing uh, vascular surgery, uh, the CREST-2 trial is underway, looking at asymptomatic carotid stenosis aggressive medical management versus endarterectomy or statins, or stenting rather, and um, the surgical series mostly come from the pre-statin era, so we're very enthusiastic. And I guess I'm cut off. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you.